Hi, welcome to another edition of Moment of Science. I'm Cameron Sahami. And I'm Kachin Yu. And we have a very special guest with us today in the uh, studio. We have uh, John Keller, who's going to discuss uh, his experiences with the Airborne Ex Observatory, as well as teaching science in the Bay Area. And he also was one of the few people that had a chance to go to the Galapagos Islands and do evolutionary research there. Kachun, could you give us a little well, John, background? Well, uh, John grew up in Idaho, and uh, he studied biology in Stanford. And after that, he um, taught high school science for about five years in the Bay Area. And right now, he's working at the Southwest Research Institution in Boulder doing planetary science research. And I guess um, working on data um, coming back from the Galileo spacecraft, if I understand it. That's right. Oh, so welcome, John. Thank you very much. <laughs> this is rather an impromptu visit, actually, since um, well, I just showed up. <laughs> but Katoon and Cameron asked me to come and talk to you briefly about some different experiences I had while mm -hmm. I was teaching high school science mm -hmm. in the Bay Area of California. Mm -hmm. So. Um, well, first of all, you, um, you had mentioned to us that um, you had been to the Galapagos Islands. Right. And yeah, that's a pretty rare them. opportunity, isn't it? Yeah, I taught, I taught high school science in, in California, and um, there was a, a unique program uh, sponsored by the Stanford's, uh, outdoor, Stanford's alumni education program um, that took about 30 students and alumni up to the Galapagos Islands, or actually down just by the equator. Um, and we, we traveled around for an entire week, going from island to island um, on, on the, uh, all, all over the Galapagos. Right now, for people who uh, don't know where the Galapagos Islands are or, what, or why they are important, can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. They're um, actually right off the coast of Ecuador, mm -hmm. which is in South America. And uh, there's about 600 miles across, 600 miles into the Pacific Ocean. Mm -hmm. What the group did is we flew from um, Florida down to Guayaquil, which is in, in Ecuador. And then we took another plane across, across the Pacific for about 600 miles to the Galapagos. Landed in an, in, in an um, at, a, at an old Air Force base, or Navy base, that they used to have during World War II there. And then got onto a boat called the um, Isabel II and traveled around for, for 10 days. So did you take a group of students down, or was it uh, basically um, for research? Actually, there were, there were 15 undergraduates and 15 alumni, and then, and then three teachers. Um, I got to go to free, for free because they wanted us, to, they, they gave scholarships to teachers to help mm -hmm. learn about the experience. Oh, wow, that's great. Yeah. So what did you guys do down there? Um, basically just traveled around and looked at, looked at all the totally amazing things that were going on on the islands. Um, the Galapagos are completely separated from, from the mainland. Um, it's a, volcan a volcanic archipelago. Uh, I mean, exactly the same thing as Hawaii, actually. Um, it's, mm. a, it's a hot spot underneath the Pacific Ocean, which is bubbling up and causing new, new islands forming all the time. Um, and so, as such, when they, when they pop up out of the ocean, they're completely barren. There's no life. It's just rock. And so all of the life that is there today has somehow gotten over to the islands, either by flying in, swimming in, or rafting in. Um, and we could talk about many of the unique animals that live there if you'd like to. Sure. Well, I, I think uh, the Galapagos were, were interesting or um, were important by, um, historically because Darwin visited mm -hmm. them. Um, during his um, research and studies right. as he traveled around the world. Yeah, good old Charles Darwin. Yeah. He uh, sailed when he was 23 years old. He got aboard the Beagle and mm -hmm. sailed around the world. Um, he had gone up and down the coast of South America and saw all the, all the different life forms that lived there. And then we got to the Galapagos. There are all these totally weird animals that he'd never that were very similar to the things in South America, but also slightly different. And so the comparison of those two was one of the first things that started him figuring out the different. Uh, he didn't actually come up with the idea of evolution while he was on the islands, but it gave him a lot of unique insights that he later used when he was writing the, writing the origin of species um, and, and, and explaining his evolutionary theory. Now, what, what, um, what are some of the examples of um, distinctive animals that um, were, were important for, for, Darwin, sort of leading up, yeah, for leading up to the idea of evolution? Yeah, um, two or three that we could talk about. Um, one, well, 
the, the biggest like classic one is the tortoise, um, the Galapagos the Galapagos tortoise. Um, there were there are tortoises and turtles all over South America, and then when Darwin got to the Galapagos Islands, he found these huge tortoises, just giant, massive land tortoises. Um, he traveled to six or seven different islands, and what was unique about each island is that each tortoise has a unique shell. Um, on each island, they have different shells. Some look like this, some look like that, some look like that. They're all kind of different shaped. Um, but so they're all similar from island to island, but each is uniquely different depending upon the island. Um, another thing that he saw were the land iguana versus the marine iguana, and this is actually kind of cool. Uh, the marine iguana is basically a lizard. Now you, don't, you normally don't have lizards that swim around in the ocean, right? Mm -hmm. um, but on the Galapagos Islands, there are these tor these lizards that swim around. They just they go around and they swim and they eat algae and stuff like that. And Darwin was really intrigued by these by these land iguana by these marine iguanas. Did I say marine? Yeah, marine iguanas. He found them on the land and he would chase them up to the. He would chase them. He was like <laughs> this 23 year old chasing around these iguanas and he chased them all over the chase all over the uh, the islands. And um, he'd push them all the way up to the cliff, and the, the iguanas wouldn't jump off the cliff into the ocean. Like, here's this ferocious, mad 23-year-old guy chasing after them, mm -hmm. and they wouldn't actually jump into the ocean. Um, so what did Darwin do? He picked it up and threw it into the ocean, and just hucked the, hucked the iguana into the ocean. <laughs> I'm sure some people had yeah. have some I'm sure lots of species could swim if they were thrown into the ocean. <laughs> right, <laughs> exactly. So the iguana swam back, uh -huh. climbed up under the shore, and looked at Darwin and said, why'd you do that? And Darwin started chasing him again, and chased the iguanas all over the all over the all over the shore, all the way up to the cliff. And um, the iguana wouldn't actually jump into the uh, into the ocean until he threw it back into the ocean. So here was Darwin basically throwing this iguana back and forth into the ocean. Um, what, what he finally theorized was actually going on is the iguanas don't have any predators on the land, but they have tons of predators in the ocean, mm -hmm. namely sharks, seals, sea lions, mm -hmm. those types of things. Um, and so when they're afraid, the insect of an iguana is to get out of the water, not to get into the water. Mm -hmm. And so even though there was this human chasing them around on the islands, they wanted to stay on the land where it was safer than going into the, into the, uh, the water. But that's an aside. That's not actually what I was supposed to talk about. <laughs> um, what, what was unique is that you have these, they have these iguanas that live on the land and these iguanas that live in the water. Mm -hmm. And, um, and what's, what's strange is you don't expect to find iguanas living in the water because they like to live on land. But the problem is if, you're, if you've got this archipelago, which is all volcanic rock, there's not a lot of plants growing up there. Um, there's more food in the water like the algae and the seaweed, and so they gradually evolved to live in the land. In well, those iguanas evolved to go into the water where there was so they, more, they were basically more food. filling a niche that. Right. Yeah. I I think the control room is unless we have a call. So we, if we could go ahead and pipe that call into the uh, studio, that'd be great. Hello. Hello. Yeah. Hi. 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 Um. I had a I had a question. You were talking about the Galapagos Islands. It sounded really fascinating. I was wondering. Um, what opportunities other uh, other people might have? Like, what kind of programs are run out to the Galapagos Islands? How could other people uh, go visit them or investigate them like you did? Mm -hmm. What kind of program were you involved in? Right. The program I was great question. Yeah. Thanks. The the program I was in was specifically a program uh, run by Stanford University. Um, the Galapagos Islands are becoming more and more. Um, there are more and more opportunities available. There are several different kind of. Well, there. Are, there are a couple different opportunities. There's the whole kind of ecotourism thing that's just going on right now, where there are a lot of companies that are basically sponsoring people to go visit the islands. Those typically are only like two to three to five to seven day trips. Um, and there are a whole bunch of issues we could go into about how those trips are actually affecting the islands, because you have more and more people visiting. Um, but then, be, apart from those kind of just kind of more tourist type trips, there is a lot of active research going on with the Galapagos Darwin Institute. Darwin Institute, the Darwin Research Institute, um, which is on the islands, and they do, um, they basically do a lot of conservation, a lot of preservation type of activities, and you'd really want to probably reach them first. I think it's called the Darwin, um, the Darwin Institute, um, and I can actually, I don't have the information right here with me right now, but I can actually get that to Kachun and Cameron, and yeah. they can, yeah. um, if you call back and get you the, the address for that. Yeah, we can put a link on the web page if you're interested in finding Great. out more about the Galapagos Islands and Great. how to get Thank down you. there. Great. Thank you for the call. Thank Perfect. you very much. <clears throat> now, but, um, back to this idea of the, the, the marine iguana basically mm -hmm. filling a niche that uh, wasn't filled before. There, I think there was a very famous example of that um, concerning a bunch of birds on the Galapagos. There were a couple of birds on the Galapagos, right? <laughs> they were the Galapagos finches. Um, 
yeah. uh, which actually I didn't see very many of. Of the things that I saw in the Galapagos, the finches were one of the fewest. Um, the, the similar idea, there are limited resources on the islands. Mm -hmm. Um, it's, it's a desert island, actually. I was really surprised. I was expecting big tropical trees, but it's all cactuses um, because there's very little rainfall on the islands. And so because food is scarce, each of the different birds had to evolve to, um, to get the food sources it could. So on different islands, there are several different fishes with different type of, type of beaks. Some are good for like dipping into, uh, into flowers and getting nectar. Others are good for like uh, breaking shells and things like that. And there's a whole different set of um, actual beak sizes and shapes for getting different types of foods. Uh, so similar differentiation as to the tortoises, different islands, different right. uh, Exactly. Um, wasn't there uh, this idea that you could see a continuum in the finches between the different, the evolution of the different beaks mm -hmm. as well? Right. Was, was that something that you were able to see or firsthand, sort of this example of evolution in action? Actually, finches look the same. <laughs> <laughs> Frankly, I mean, my, not, I mean, I wasn't there long enough or didn't go to enough islands to see that distinction, um, but there are, there's a lot of research being going on there right now where they've done very, very close studies and they've actually correlated beak sizes to different, or, or variations in the population as they result from different uh, weather patterns. Mm -hmm. So like even in the 1980s, there were these severe droughts and actually the population shifted one direction mm -hmm. towards mm -hmm. a certain type of finch being more successful than other types of finches. Oh wow, so it does respond really quickly to the environment. Well, it's not evolution per se. It's, mm -hmm. just, it's just distinctions in variations, like distinctions in the population, like going one way or the other. Um, we don't have any specific examples of something evolving, but there are many, many kind of characteristic like like there's there's a continuum where where if you over time you can see where it could happen. You also find the ancestor of these finches on the mainland too. Um, yes, okay. exactly. Okay. Yeah, same with the tortoises, same with the iguanas, same with the finches. Mm -hmm. um, they, and that was what was so unique, unique to Darwin was he'd been traveling around um, and seeing all these normal land forms, uh, animal forms on the land mm -hmm. of the South America. And when he got to the Galapagos, they were all subtly different, and they basically filled different niches. Mm -hmm. Well, great. Well, if any of our uh, audience members out there have a call for John, please feel free to call in, and we'll go ahead and make sure the, uh, the, the phone numbers for the studio are running. So if you have any questions for John about evolution of the Galapagos Islands, feel free to call in. Right. Right. Well, I, I think uh, the, um, the other interesting experience that um, you've had um, in the recent past has been working on an airborne observatory. Right. Um, and, and this is sort of switching gear or something. Like yeah, it's a little different than the Galapagos Islands, I guess. <laughs> right. Um, another, I mean, while I was teaching high school in the Bay Area, I basically had summers off and got a lot of different opportunities to do different things. So one of those was going to the Galapagos during that summer. Another was um, flying aboard the Kuiper Airborne Observatory, which is a NASA airplane um, that unfortunately is no longer flying, but we'll talk about that later. Um, but it's, it's an airborne observatory that flew for 25 years um, to conduct infrared astronomy mm -hmm. um, and uh, to carry out research that could only actually be done from really high altitudes. Now, why is that? And, and hence a plane. The thing about infrared astronomy is that there's infrared light being given off by everything. I mean, we're pretty warm ourselves, and so we give off infrared heat and stuff like that. We can see, you can see with night, night vision goggles, that's basically looking in the infrared. Um, there's infrared energy everywhere. You want to be able to see it in the universe as well. But as light coming from stars and galaxies and other astronomical objects comes down to our atmosphere, it gets absorbed by all of the water vapor mm -hmm. that is in our atmosphere. So um, in order to look at stars and planets and galaxies in the infrared, you have to be up above that water vapor because otherwise it's just a big cloud. It's, like, it's basically trying to like, look up from the bottom of a swimming pool at something that's up above the swimming pool because all the water in the middle basically absorbs mm -hmm. all that infrared light and you can't see any of that heat. Um, you can't see any of that light. And so what NASA did is they built an airplane um, that flies at 41,000 feet. It's a, it's a, well, it actually, NASA didn't build the airplane. The US military built the airplane. Um, was it a modified 747, I think? No, they built a C-141 cargo oh, okay, plane. Okay, okay. Um, one of the, basically a World War II airplane called the C-141, mm -hmm. um, which is a cargo plane that flies at 41,000 feet. They bought it from the military, put a big hole in the side, and put a telescope in the middle of that hole, or like in, inside, of the t inside of the airplane. They fly to 41,000 feet, open up the hole, and can, can do the infrared astronomy from up above the water vapor. Mm -hmm. So is there any problems with, say, tracking or trying to keep a fix on the object that you're taking? No, none at all. No, it's just, it's just cruising you know, around yeah, in an airplane, I mean, looking I mean, out the telescope. You've all had the experience of like being in, in a car 
while your sister is driving and you've got your binoculars and you like basically put your binoculars <laughs> to your face and you try to look around. <laughs> and it's really easy to see things, right? <laughs> um, that's the same thing. You've got an airplane that's flying at 41,000 feet. It's going, um, it's going 300 miles an hour. It's basically bouncing up and down and rocking up and, you know, with all the turbulence and stuff. And you're trying to look at one single point of light that's not moving. Mm -hmm. And so it's really amazing what it does. They actually built an internal computer system that, um, that flies the airplane. Um, the, wow. the telescope is pointing, the telescope is pointing at a star, and as the star drifts one direction, the computer tells the airplane to go another way. So the, the computer actually has some, it has some control wow. of the automatic pilot and, tells, and, and helps it keep on course. Mm -hmm. Now that's, that's enough for, like the, the, for the gross adjustments of the airplane. To get the actual specific tracking, just the vibration cushion, they actually lift the entire, um, I'll, I don't know how heavy it is, I'll guess it's a two ton or one ton, no, we'll say it's a one-ton telescope. It's a big telescope. It's a one a one-meter telescope. They actually float the entire telescope on a on, an, on a cushion of air. Mm -hmm. So it's floating on liquid nitrogen air that's pumped in at high pressure. It's floating. It's not touching anything. And they use electromagnets to steer it back and forth. Mm -hmm. So as you're flying around, it's really bizarre because because you're in the airplane and you're looking at the telescope and it's like bouncing and rocking and vibrating and doing all these things as you fly. But in actuality, it's you who's mm -hmm. vibrating around it. I mean, wow. it's this perfectly stationary ball that's pointing in one direction, and the whole airplane is is wo is wobbling back and forth. Now, are, you, are you in the same the room that the telescope is in, or are you separated, often in different compartments? No, we're separated um, because the telescope is actually exposed to the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. um, it's at 41,000 feet, which is very low atmosphere, yeah. um, and you would pass out within 20 minutes, 20 seconds if mm -hmm. you were in that environment. It's sealed off in its own separate con in its own separate container. Um, and, but then the whole rest of the cargo plane is, is gutted and basically filled with computers and, and seats and chairs and people um, controlling the telescope. Um, you, we were able to walk up and down with the telescope operators, the astronomers, go up into the cockpit and sit with the pilots and do all types of things. Yeah. Um, and then, but you can see the outside of the telescope. You can see the bearings and things that's making it vibrate back and forth. So what types of things do you look at? Obviously things that emit in the infrared, but mm -hmm. what specifically? Um, the flights that I was aboard, um, they, there was one group that was looking at active galaxies. Um, active galaxies, right, yeah. Um, the, another group was, was doing some Jupiter imaging. Um, imaging Jupiter. Uh, that, during the Shoemaker-Levy 9 impact, I wasn't actually aboard that flight, mm -hmm. but um, during the Shoemaker-Levy uh, 9 impact, they did a lot of water studies from the Airborne Observatory. What was unique about that, well, actually that's not unique about this. What is unique about the airplane, though, is that it can fly wherever it wants to go. Mm -hmm. So several times there are things, like for example, the supernova that we had in 1989, um, it it occurred in the southern hemisphere. You couldn't see the supernova from, I think. from the northern hemisphere. Um, and so, yeah. yeah, was it 87? Yeah, 1987. This is the 89 it's, one, it's, two years yeah. later, <laughs> <laughs> whatever. Um, the, the 1987 supernova, um, they were actually able to fly the, tel fly the airplane down to South America, do the observations from the, from the southern hemisphere in the infrared, mm -hmm. and basically so the airplane can go wherever it wants to and do all types oh. of observations. That's yeah, something you can't do with Kit Peak. I think we've got a, a telephone call. Mm -hmm. If we could go ahead and pipe that into the uh, studio, please. Hello? Yeah, Hello. hi. Hi, I was wondering, I've been hearing a lot about the Hubble Space Telescope uh, lately, and I was wondering, that's up above the atmosphere too, so why would astronomers want to use a space telescope or an airborne observatory? Why would you want one rather than the other, or why are there both? Mm -hmm. So I guess the question is, what really are the differences between the airborne observatory and Hubble, and uh, why would you use one versus the other? Right. Um, actually, do you guys know anything about the infrared capabilities of the Hubble? Well, Hubble um, doesn't, just um, during the last service emission, it, it got a new infrared detector. Mm -hmm. So now it can do infrared. But prior to that, it didn't yeah, have the capability. Yeah, prior to that, it, it, right. it was only looking in the optical okay. and UV. Yeah, um, there, there is a benefit to having both a, a platform that's orbiting around the entire planet, like a satellite, and then also just an airplane that can fly from, from the ground. Um, there was a, a really good satellite called IRES, um, which was an infrared air, infrared satellite. I don't know what the A stands for. Infrared something Astronomical satellite. satellite. Astronomical yeah, satellite, right. Something like that. Um, and it, it did actually, it was up above the atmosphere and it was, it was exactly the same as Hubble. It was an orbiting telescope that did a huge survey of the infrared galaxy, of the infrared universe. Um, which is which is beneficial. Uh, the thing about the about the Kuiper Airborne Observatory was basically it was built 25 years ago. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was built 
what's this 1979? It was built in the 70s, um, before we were really even doing a lot of satellites technology and, and telescope technology in space. And so they, uh, uh, Gerard Kuiper, who helped develop the telescope, um, was able to basically put a telescope in an airplane, get it up really fast, get it up really cheap, um, and get people and, and, and do a much cheaper operation and still get a lot of really good data um, from the airplane platform rather than having to put a, a whole bunch of money into a space satellite platform as well. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, they're both beneficial. Um, one is a lot cheaper to operate, the other is, has maybe a little bit more, is even higher and can do a little bit uh, more precise science, per se. Great, thank you. Sure, yeah, yeah. that was a great question. Good question. So. Um, now, what um, exactly, what, what sort of science did you do when you were? When I was aboard the, yeah. the Kuiper Airborne Observatory? Yeah. Um, well, <laughs> um, the, the nature of the program I was on, it was called, uh, it was called FOSTER, which is, which is Flight Opportunities for Science Teachers Enrichment. So I, again, was t still teaching high school. Um, I wasn't actually doing any grad proposals or doing any of the actual research. I was more just helping out with what the other people were doing, kind of looking over the shoulders of lots of scientists. Um, I didn't actually have my own research stuff that I was, that I was okay. responsible for. Um, what was unique about the, what the idea of the program for me was to basically fly aboard the Kuiper, uh, have my students learn about the experience, learn about infrared astronomy, and then come back and um, explain that to them. And the students got really, really excited because like, I was going up on this big uh, airplane wow. and doing all these types of you know, crazy telescope yeah. things. Um, so I actually didn't do any of the research Per se. Mm -hmm. But uh, you are actually working at the Southwest Research Institute now, right? Is that right? Correct? Yeah. And you're working on uh, uh, Jupiter, uh, imaging right. stuff from Galileo? or? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I'm working at Southwest Research Institute with Clark Chapman, um, who is on the, uh, the Galileo uh, imaging team. Mm -hmm. uh, Galileo has, has a solid state imager, which basically takes visual pictures of, of Jupiter and its moons. Um, and I'm working right now with Clark, um, basically analyzing images of Europa, Ganymede, and, and Callisto, um, the three outer of the, of the Galilean satellites. Wow. Are you still teaching, or are you still keeping a... Uh, I um, think it's really interesting to see the dichotomy between people that are actually research scientists and teachers, because so, very often you just get one or the other, and it's a really interesting pair of worlds to straddle. Yeah, it's a completely different pair of worlds to straddle, actually. Um, I've, I basically, that's kind of what I'm exploring right now. I taught high school for five years um, and then really enjoyed it, but also liked, knew that I wanted to do research as well, but didn't have the really the credentials or the, the training to do any of it. So I basically stopped teaching last spring and started school this, this fall um, and, and, and now getting more into the research side of science, which I think is, I mean, to me has been very fascinating to, to really dive deeply into that world of, you know, of, of research. It's very different than working with 150 high schoolers every day. Um, you know, you're, you're sitting in a, in a much smaller space with a, with a lot more um, kind of time and management over your own life. Um, but, but it's very, very intriguing to be able to, to get that kind of direct hands-on exposure in research. And I think there has been a lot of criticism of, um, from people outside academia for mm -hmm. saying, you know, scientists and professors who are doing research aren't spending enough time teaching. Mm -hmm. But I think um, in a lot of cases, especially in astronomy or biology, um, I mean, the professors do interact mm -hmm. with um, students. I mean, they do right. have to go out and right. teach the public in, in some sense. Do you find any differences between, you know, doing biology to 150 kids uh -huh. and now to a totally different audience? Uh, yeah, it's, um, well, a couple, a couple of things. One is like these programs I went on with the Galapagos Islands and the Kuiper Airborne Observatory, those were all opportunities for me to really see science happening and also to have the scientists interact with me as a teacher as well as meet with my students and really help the students learn more about science. And so those opportunities are very, very present and very, very cool. I mean, that's, that's what I'd really like to be involved in after, as I get more and more involved in science. Um, at CU, there are a lot of programs with the SBO Observatory. Um, where and the planetarium, where there are opportunities for scientists to give give, give guest lectures and give guest presentations and really kind of do public outreach um, about the science and research that they're doing. Um, 
I think that, and, and those, so those programs, those programs exist and, and are very, very, very good. Um, the, and personally, my only experience that I've been able to do so far in, while I've been stu studying and doing research has been doing public observing nights. Um, but as I get more and more involved in the research, the opportunities will hopefully exist for me to go and do more outreach as well. Um, have you guys gotten any chance to do outreach things as well? Well, or a few. Yeah, apart actually, from this program, which is one of those. <laughs> yeah, I guess we're somewhat in a similar situation. Yeah, yeah. Here, but I think this, this is probably one, our, our big investment in mm -hmm. outreach yeah. right. through this show. Yeah, because, I mean, this, basically, I mean, I found that students really, really, were really, really interested in everything that, that scientists were doing. Mm -hmm. I mean, you go into a classroom and they basically, well, the students are sitting there. Um, what are we going to learn today? And if you say, we're going to, you know, I have a guest lecture from NASA Ames coming to talk to you tomorrow, they get really excited about those types of things. Or, um, you know, here's a slideshow of the Galapagos Islands, or whatever other experience you can bring in from the real life um, really does make the learning much more, much more real to them. It's even best to take them out actually on the field trips. Um, mm -hmm. In, in actuality, two of my students got to fly on the Kuiper Urban Observatory. Wow, wow. Um, that's there a was, tremendous opportunity. Yeah, there was a public outreach program called Live from the Stratosphere, mm -hmm. um, which is also similar to Live from, there are several Live from programs that NASA sponsors. Mm -hmm. And so um, one of my students flew aboard the Kuiper for eight hours mm -hmm. with a direct satellite uplink to a classrooms all over the country. Wow. And wow. students were also able to ask questions to her and the scientists aboard the Kuiper as it was flying around mm -hmm. and have mm -hmm. a kind of a live interaction. Now, was this, um, did they have to submit a proposal or some sort of application to um, get into this program? It was, did my students have to? Yeah. Okay. Um, it was, that was actually just a, a kind of a, a coincidence. Um, they were looking all over the Bay Area for students mm -hmm. um, to fly aboard the observatory, and they, uh, it just happened that one of the people that I knew uh, was, was accepted for that. Um, and so it was more of a locality thing. The school mm -hmm. I taught was very close to where the airplane flies from. Mm -hmm. um, the whole program is sponsored by NASA. Um, NASA has, um, they funded the antennas and the uplinks and all of the, the recording things. Wow. Well, that's a tremendous opportunity. Uh, it's, it's always great to see uh, a scientist, working research scientist, who's really willing to take the time out and uh, you know, d not only teach, but actually do the public outreach and you know, communicate what they do to other people because it's, it seems that lately, you know, uh, science has really sort of taken a bad image in the uh, in the press and in American society in general. And I think the biggest problem with that is there's just a lack of communication between people who do science mm -hmm. and the general public. And it's great to see someone actually going out there and you know, trying to yeah. breach this gap. Yeah, part of it is a, is a time issue. I mean, basically, teachers are really, really busy, and scientists are really, really busy. Um, I've noticed that in both both jobs. You know, when I was teaching, I was working 12-hour days, and doing research science now, I'm doing 10 and 12-hour days. Well nine to 12 hour days. And, um, and there is there's just, the time is very limited. And so, and it also takes a lot of effort to get both, both groups together to do the outreach. Mm -hmm. But when it does actually happen, when you can actually get um, actual researchers together with actual students and um, with, with teachers involved in the process as well, it can be a really good link and uh, right. do a lot for That's education. Great. Well, they're letting us know that we've got about a minute left. So um, I'd like to thank um, John for being on our show. Yes, thanks a lot, John. Sure. Especially on, on, on a very short notice. Yeah. <laughs> and also, if you'd like to hear more about these opportunities in uh, teaching and uh, education, we're going to have some links on the web page. If you go ahead and roll the web page graphic mm -hmm. uh, right down there, and you can there'll be a link to John's page, and there'll be a link to various uh, NASA outreach programs and SBO and so on and so forth if you're interested in these topics. And as always, if you have any questions, or any comments, please feel free to email Kachun and I. Our emails are also down at the bottom there. Mm -hmm. And uh, thanks a lot for joining us. All right.